Hello all. So uh, welcome to the second session on vertical integration topic. So uh, today like uh, in the last class we selected anemia and today we have a different topic and uh, that's what we are going to discuss is thyroid. Regarding thyroid, uh, we'll uh, have uh, faculties from Department of uh, Medicine representing by Dr. Renoy who is additional professor in the Department of General Medicine and we have uh, Dr. Siddhu representing from the Department of General Surgery, he is assistant professor and uh, Dr. Dimple from the Department of Anatomy, she is the associate assistant professor there and uh, Dr. Rose from the Department of uh, Physiology who is associate professor. So we have got an uh, very good panel here. So. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll be going through certain uh, questions to them and uh, we will try to be as interactive as possible and uh, we'll uh, go through the anatomy, the physiology and basic clinical features of uh, thyroid related diseases and to conclude uh, what is the final answer that is the surgeon uh, whether we require surgery or not that will be your uh, take. So. Uh, with this in mind, I'll uh, asking to start with uh, Dr. Dimple. Can you just briefly give an overview about the thyroid gland? Thank you for the brief introduction. Um, the thyroid gland is a highly vascular uh, butterfly-shaped gland, which is uh, situated in the uh, front of the neck at the level of the uh, trachea. Um, in the, between the fifth, sixth, and seventh cervical vertebra up until the first thoracic vertebrae. It is a head-shaped gland, um, and it has two lobes. The two lobes uh, are connected in the central uh, part of the neck at the level of the uh, second to fourth uh, uh, tracheal rings by the intervening isthmus. Now the um, thyroid gland is an encapsulated gland so it has uh, two different capsules that's the true capsule and the false capsule. The true capsule is actually a fibrous condensation of the stroma of the gland itself so it is true to the uh, thyroid gland whereas the false capsule is um, due to the splitting up of the pretracheal fascia as the fascia, uh, the, um, fascia of the neck so um, that's the two different capsules. Now, uh, modification of this false uh, capsule is called as the Berry's ligament of the thyroid gland, which attaches uh, uh, itself to the cricoid. So, such an anatomical attachment of the thyroid to the cricoid because of this uh, ligament of Berry um, is the basis for which the thyroid gland moves uh, with deglutition. So, that has to be kept in mind. Okay. Now, coming to the morphology of the thyroid, the external features, it it has, as I said, it has uh, two lobes and it has, each lobe has uh, apex, base and uh, three surfaces, that's the superficial surface, the deep surface and the medial surface. Um, these surfaces are separated by the anterior border which is sharp and the posterior border which is more blunt. And uh, the intervening isthmus, um, it lies between the second to fourth uh, tracheal rings and this isthmus also has an uh, anterior surface, posterior surface and a superior and inferior border. So, um, to briefly explain the extent of the uh, thyroid gland, the apex it extends up to the oblique line of the thyroid cartilage, whereas the base it extends up to the fifth to sixth tracheal rings. But um, the isthmus is not so, it, is, uh, it falls a little short, so it lies between the second to fourth tracheal rings. So, this is the brief introduction. Okay. Uh, can you just uh, give me the blood supply, if anything specific yeah. to thyroid, because we have a surgeon right now here, so they will be very uh, much knowing about the blood supply. Yes, so, the um, uh, thyroid gland is supplied, supplied by mainly two uh, arterial supply, the superior thyroid and the inferior thyroid artery. Okay. The superior thyroid artery is a branch of the external carotid, a direct branch of the external carotid artery and at the it reaches up to the apex of the thyroid gland and it divides into anterior and posterior branches uh, and um, this superior thyroid artery it is also accompanied by a nerve okay. which is the external laryngeal nerve okay. so this anatomical relation of the artery with the nerve in relation to the apex is of extreme clinical importance in respect to the surgeons sure, sure. Okay. Uh, that I think yeah, that we'll, say. Uh, we'll definitely come go to that. the coming to the other artery that's the inferior thyroid artery okay. the inferior thyroid artery uh, is a branch of the thyrocervical trunk that also supplies the um, um, thyroid gland Sometimes the, uh, in 30 percentage of the cases, uh, according to our literature, there is an apparent artery, which is the thyroid or ima artery, the which I was about to supplies ask. the isthmus of the yeah. thyroid gland. Okay, yeah. because the only thing that I remember from the blood supply is the thyroid ima artery <laughs> when I was learning. So uh, that's the uh, difference. Okay, fine. So uh, 
one more uh, just quick question is that uh, what all questions they can expect from anatomy uh, the students uh, like an essay question what all they can expect from anatomy regarding thyroid the main uh, it is usually a very uh, expected question okay. so the external features the okay. relations of the lobes and, okay. and the isthmus because there is a lot of important uh, relations of the gland to the other surrounding structures okay. the knowledge of which is extremely important during surgical interventions okay. and also the blood supply of the thyroid gland okay. is of extreme importance they should know the diagrammatic Definitely. representation yes and also the microscopic uh, features, features of, of the thyroid gland is okay. also important. okay thank you thank you dr thank you. for that elaborative discussion and uh, next uh, we'll go to the physiology one and uh, dr rose can you just uh, briefly tell us the different hormones produced from the gland and its regulation so coming to the main two functions of the thyroid gland that is one is to secrete the thyroid hormones which okay. maintain the metabolism in the tissues okay. and the second is to secrete calcitonin by okay. the parafollicular or the C cells of the thyroid gland. Okay. So coming to the various thyroid hormones we have T3, T4 and reverse T3. Okay. So this T4 it is also called thyroxine okay. or tetraiodothyronine and okay. this forms 90% of the thyroid output. Okay. Then we have T3 or triiodothyronine which forms 10% of the thyroid output. Okay. Then we have the reverse T3 or RT3 which is biologically inactive okay. and it forms less than 1% of the thyroid okay. output. So when you compare T4 with T3, the T3 is more biologically active okay. than T4. Okay. And uh, this uh, T3 is generated at the site of the action by the deiodination of T4. Okay. Now coming how it is regulated, the okay. secretion of thyroid hormone. Actually that is through the hypothalamo hypophyseal and thyroid axis. Okay. 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 So from the hypothalamus actually TRH or the thyrotropin releasing hormone is released. Okay. And this TRH release actually it is controlled by nervous stimuli like emotion, stress, exposure to cold, etc. Okay. And this TRH that is released from the hypothalamus, it will go and stimulate the anterior pituitary or the adenine hypophysis okay. to release the thyroid stimulating hormone okay. or it is also called thyrotropin. Okay. Okay. And this TSH, it will go and stimulate the thyroid gland to okay. secrete various thyroid hormones. Okay. So whenever there is an increase in thyroid hormone, it inhibits TRH from the hypothalamus as well as TSH from the anterior and pituitary and this inhibition is more by T3 okay. and to a lesser extent by T4. Okay. Okay. So this is about the hormonal okay. and the And what is when we do the investigation I have always been <coughs> writing free T3, free T4. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you, uh, what is this free T3, free T4? That's in the circulation that's what I think. Uh, yeah, free T3 yeah. is in the, in the circulation. circulation. Fine. So, uh, the T3 and T4, when we assess, when we ask for the investigation, we usually ask free T3. That I'll, uh, maybe we can discuss that. <coughs> okay. So, again, questions that they can expect from uh, this area. Actually, as far as physiology is concerned, this thyroid gland is an essay for them. Okay. Name the thyroid hormones. Okay. Then about the synthesis and secretion and okay. storage. Okay. Storage and secretion of thyroid hormone. Then okay. about the physiological actions or okay. the functions of thyroid gland. Okay. So, that is a very important <coughs> expected essay. It's a very essay. expected essay. For them. Okay. With that uh, in background, we will come to Dr. Rina. Can you just briefly tell us regarding the common disorders associated with thyroid gland? Yeah, I think this will be a, a continuation from what uh, has been already mentioned because I think situations where actually the thyroid hormone is in excess, which can again further be subdivided into primary, which is actually affecting the thyroid gland per se, and uh, secondary causes. Okay. The primary ca causes where actually it is in excess uh, would be the most common one is the Graves disease okay. or an MNG that is a multinodular goiter which is actually hypersecreting or a toxic single <coughs> nodule or a solitary adenoma. These are the common things that are there. Okay. But uh, nowadays we see a lot of uh, thyroiditis okay. in picture where actually there is destruction of the thyroid gland after a viral infection like a subacute decurvance like a viral thyroiditis or even sometimes postpartum cases where there is a significant thyroiditis. So these are the important things which usually causes the problems in the thyroid. But having said that, iatrogenic causes cannot be completely uh, ruled out because iatrogenic causes where actually you give uh, radio frequency ablations as well as other therapies which can affect the thyroid gland can also cause uh, hypersecretion also. Lithium, uh, 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 sorry, amiodarone and other drugs which can also be actually given which also causes both hyper as well as uh, hypothyroidism. Hyper hypothyroidism is also quite uh, 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 commonly seen. 
and obviously the other uh, malignancies which can also cause increasing uh, uh, thyroid uh, functions or hypersecretions. The secondary one in uh, hormonal excess uh, would be because of some TSH secreting uh, tumors per se. Now uh, coming to the next division that is hormone deficiency that is actually classically presenting as hypothyroidism. Hypothyroidism the most common again would be an autoimmune like uh, Hashimoto's uh, thyroiditis. Uh, iodine deficiency can be actually seen in uh, uh, probably mountainous areas and things like that which definitely with iodized salts and uh, other things it is definitely significantly come down. Uh, the other things uh, which are important is actually the hypothyroid phase of the uh, thyroiditis okay. per se. Okay, uh, Patients can go through a hyperthyroid phase then uh, a youth thyroid and most of these people actually mm -hmm. end up into uh, a hypothyroid phase. Uh, then again, whenever you think of this one, I think uh, iatrogenic causes also have to be looked at. Iodine therapy, uh, thyroidectomy uh, or any anti-thyroid drugs in excess can also cause this particular problem. Whereas secondary causes, definitely I think uh, again the most important thing is uh, the pituitary, pan hypopituitarism can also cause uh, a sec be a secondary cause of uh, hypothyroidism. The other thing is actually uh, which predominantly comes into his uh, 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 branch which is actually a, a, a nodule or a, a tumor that is there in the uh, thyroid. This is one of the common presentations that to the hospital. Uh, they actually come to the doctor saying that there is there a thyroid is. Uh, a nodule which could be probably non-functioning. It could be because of multiple reasons actually, uh, some of which comes into hyper and hypothyroidism as well. Uh, some of them uh, like uh, lymphomas or uh, certain other malignancies which need not be always functional. So this is a brief overview of uh, different types of uh, Disorder. thyroid disorders which present. And uh, just one more question sir, do you think stress has got any role uh, in uh, creating hypo and hypothyroidism? Because when we look into the physiological aspects, Definitely the stress response, uh, definitely there is going to be an increase in hormone production. Because now the recently we, when I was uh, studying, during that time and all, we were thinking that hyperthyroidism is causing the stress to the patient, rather than stress causing hyperthyroidism is that what we need to think. Because right now we are seeing a lot of hyper, previously we used to see a lot of hypo. No, uh, stress probably, I mean, I'm not sure exactly, but one thing that is very classically described is the CQ thyroid syndrome, so where actually non-thyroidal illness or especially critical kind of illness, which is uh, uh, stress being one of the factors, definitely, among the other factors that are there, can uh, produce certain abnormalities in the thyroid functions, okay? And uh, that, I think, probably will answer partially your question, yes, but yes, yes. pure stress uh, in the form of like uh, stress happening in your life uh, uh, and things like that, whether it will affect the thyroid is something I cannot concretely uh, concretely uh, say no about. Tool assess to assess that stress. also. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Sidhu, the next thing uh, is that uh, we see a lot of patients with neck swelling. Next thing that we call is that short over surgeon. So, a patient has come to you with a neck swelling. So, how will you approach uh, a thyroid swelling or a neck swelling to the? I will be more precise. Maybe a thyroid swelling. Yeah. Uh, so, so uh, thyroid swelling, uh, first itself assessment of the thyroid swelling will be starting with the age because different age group uh, patients will, ha will be having different type of thyroid swellings. Then we will see for the uh, place where the patient is coming from, whether the patient is coming from an endemic area for goiter or a non-endemic area. So these are the important things and of course the sex of the patient. Female patients are more prone to get thyroid disorders when compared to male patients. So these are the things which we ask in the biodata of the patient. And coming to the chief complaint, almost always 90% of patients will be coming with a neck swelling. So the main chief complaint will be the swelling in front of the neck. Some others may, may have associated pain also. So um, again, history of present illness, we will be asking the details of the swelling. When the swelling was first noticed, uh, especially in case of thyroid swelling, it will be first seen rather than felt first. So when uh, the thyroid swelling was first seen, whether the, it was noticed by the patient relatives or whether the patient saw it while looking into the mirror, such things we will ask. Then whether the swelling is gradually increasing in size or rapidly increasing in size, whether there is any associated swellings other than the swelling which is noticed in the thyroid region. So all these uh, regarding the swelling we will be asking in the history. Second, this is regarding the first heading, the swelling heading which we will be asking. Second, we will ask for features of hyper or hypothyroidism, which 
uh, we'll course, which we'll be discussing later. Then third, we'll be asking for any features of primary or secondary thyrotoxicosis. Okay. Again, that I think we'll be discussing. Fourth, broad heading will be any features of compression symptoms because okay. this thyroid swelling, when it increases, increases in size, it will be compressing the structures underneath which will be the trachea, the uh, esophagus and the recurrent laryngeal nerve which can cause dyspnea, dysphagia, hoarseness of voice. Okay. So fourth broad heading will be the uh, compression okay. symptoms and the fifth broad heading will be to rule out history which we will be asking to rule out malignancy. Uh, mostly thyroid malignancies, papillary carcinoma will be metastasizing to the surrounding lymph nodes, cervical lymph nodes. So we will be asking history of any other swelling which the patient has noticed in the neck. Second uh, history will be any uh, skull or any flat bone swellings because follicular carcinoma will be metastasizing to flat bones. And we will be asking for any hemoptysis or cough for any lung metastasis. <coughs> or any jaundice for liver metastasis. So this finishes the chief complaint and the history of present illness. And uh, now we'll be asking for past history, which uh, most important will be any history of irradiation in the past, okay. because that is very prone for developing papillary carcinoma of thyroid. Then other uh, uh, personal history, like uh, whether the patient is taking any uh, diet, which is rich in brassica family, like cabbage, uh, vegetables and all. So that is also important. Then coming to drug history, already Renoy sir had discussed a few drugs, any antithyroid drugs, drugs like lithium amiodron, which interacts with the thyroid hormone production. So such history we'll be asking uh, in detail in a case of thyroid swelling. And of course, one, one more sir, one more thing sir, family history, because medullary carcinoma of thyroid, uh, which is associated with men's syndrome, can run in the family and it can present in a, as a congenital thyroid swelling. Which is a uh, which is of importance. Okay. Uh, so uh, my question is that uh, in a sixteen-year-old girl has come to your OPD and she is telling that she is having some neck swelling. So how will you have asked this history? So examination per se of the swelling, how will you proceed? So uh, this is uh, this is only regarding the history part which I have discussed yes. so far. Now we want to do a clinical examination. So. Uh, after taking this brief history, we will be proceeding with the clinical examination. If the patient is a normal built patient with a thyroid swelling, we will be uh, see, uh, inspecting the patient with a neck slightly extended, sitting in front of the patient, we will be uh, seeing for inspection. Okay. Then there is a named method for inspection which is the Pisilos method, wherein uh, we use this method only for short neck patients and for obese patient, wherein we clasp the fingers, keep it in the occiput and tell the patient to extend the neck so that the thyroid, the cervical vertebra will be pushing the thyroid gland forward so that on inspection we will be seeing the gland much clearer. So um, normal patients, we will discuss about normal patients, so uh, with neck ex uh, slightly extended we will see uh, for the thyroid gland, we will see how the swelling is, whether it is on the left side, right side or central wherever it is, we will see. Um, the extent of the thyroid swelling, where it is extending, we will see for the lower border of the thyroid swelling. And the main thing, as ma'am had already discussed, we see whether the swelling is moving with deglutition or not. Because there are very few swellings in the neck which moves with deglutition. And thyroid swelling is one of the most common swelling with moves with deglutition. This is uh, regarding the inspection. We see for any scars, any sinuses or the any other, uh, any routine, routine things or, or, uh, which we discuss in the swelling chapter itself. Then uh, we'll come uh, to the palpation aspect. Palpation, we'll uh, usually normal thyroid patients will palpate standing from behind, and uh, we'll we'll not ask the patient to extend the neck. Rather than slightly flexed, we'll uh, start palpating from behind the patient. We'll be using the four fingers uh, on each lobe. We'll be palpating, and we'll be seeing for any palpable nodules. Uh, if the if the gland is uh, have uh, what what the extent of the gland is then we will be seeing for the lower border whether it is palpable or not because on inspection if you are not seeing the lower border then we'll, we should be doing the Pemberton's test to see for any retrosternal extension because that is of surgical importance. So in palpation we will be confirming the retrosternal extension by uh, uh, going and seeing the lower border of the thyroid whether it is palpable or not. Then we will see for the position of the trachea where the trachea, if it is a one side enlarged nodule, it will be pushing the trachea to the opposite side, which may or may cause a sign called the trail sign, that is prominence of the head of sternocleidomastoid. So that can also be seen. 
um, that is about palpation and of course we will be palpating the other neck swellings, any other uh, lymph node which is present or not. Then we will proceed with the percussion, percussion we usually do on the manubrium uh, sternae uh, to see for any retrosternal extension. If it is uh, usually it is resonant note, if it is a dull note then we can suspect a retrosternal extension. Then last we will uh, auscultate for the uh, thyroid brewery, especially we will be auscultating on the superior thyroid artery because it is a direct branch as ma'am was telling, it is a direct branch, branch from the external carotid artery and about 80% of the blood supply of the thyroid will be coming from the superior thyroid artery. That is the reason why we are uh, auscultating on the superior pole for the superior thyroid artery brewery. Thank you, Shindu. Uh, so the questions I think I will ask you least because we have a lot of other things from this because anatomy physiology we have started. Uh, uh, Dr. Dimple, can you just briefly uh, describe the histology of the thyroid gland? Any, uh, so as you said, the histology is next, uh, most important question. Yeah. So. Well, uh, the histology of the thyroid gland, the, as I said earlier, the um, thyroid gland is uh, encapsulated, has a capsule. So, the capsule of the thyroid gland sends in a septa into the parenchyma of the thyroid gland, thereby dividing the parenchyma into lobules. Okay. So, within each lobule, there will be presence of uh, 40 to 50 follicles, okay. thyroid follicles. So, the uh, follicles, um, each follicle as per when we, say, when we take, the follicles are lined by... Uh, um, cells and in the center of the follicle there is a space wherein there is accumulation of colloid. Okay. So uh, the shape of the follicular cells uh, is uh, varies based on the um, activity of the thyroid gland. Okay. So if it uh, so based on the activity we uh, divide or uh, see the follicular cells in different shapes. So um, if it's an inactive thyroid gland, then the colloid which is present in the center is abundant. Okay. So this colloid pushes the cells towards the periphery. So, the, by the cells, the follicular cells have a more flattened appearance, they are more squamous. Okay. This is an inactive uh, thyroid, inactive stage. In the moderately active stage, the um, colloid uh, is moderate in amount. So, thereby the cells, the follicular cells are ha assume a cuboidal shape. So, they are okay. cuboidal cells. In a highly active stage, the colloid is very minimum. So, because of that, the follicular cells are, have tall columnar cell okay. appearance. So, based on the active of the cell, the ch it changes. Histology changes. Uh, the histology changes. And um, in uh, not only the follicular cells, we do see also uh, C cells. They okay. are also called as uh, clear cells. They are polyhedral cells and they are highly eosinophilic cells. Be these cells can be seen between the basin membrane uh, of the follicle and with that of the cell or between two different follicles. So, um, <coughs> All these um, uh, slides are usually stained by H&E staining, H &E the staining. hematoxylin used in staining. And they need to draw this for your exam? Definitely, they'll Definitely. have to draw this. a very uh, commonly asked question. question okay. uh, histology of the thyroid gland. Yes. It's a very simple question if it's been asked. Okay. okay. <laughs> Easy to draw. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Thank you Dr. Yes, now I'll uh, to Dr. Rose. <coughs> Uh, can you just briefly uh, tell regarding the synthesis and storage of the thyroid hormones? Yeah. So, uh, as you know, iodine actually it is very essential for the synthesis of thyroid oil. Okay, okay. And we ingest the iodine in the form of iodides. Okay. And 95% of the total body iodine is present in the thyroid gland. Okay. That is 5% in the follicular cells and 90% in the colloid okay. as part of thyroglobin. So, coming to the steps in the synthesis uh, and storage of thyroid hormone, we, are, we have mainly six steps. Okay. So, first is iodide trapping. Second is the synthesis and secretion of thyroglobulin. Third is oxidation of the trapped iodine. Okay. Then fourth is the organification of thyroglobulin. Then fifth, coupling reaction. And finally, the hormone that is being synthesized is stored. Okay. So, uh, since the synthesis and secretion and the storage is usually asked as a uh, essay or a short note. Okay. So, in the synthesis, uh, I told you there are six steps. Okay. So, let's discuss each step a little bit in detail. Yeah. So, first is iodide trapping. So, okay. what I told is what we ingest is in the form of iodides. And this iodides from the bloodstream, it will enter the thyroid follicular cells through a symporter called the sodium iodide symporter. Okay. And this symporter, it is present in the basolateral membrane of the thyroid follicular cell. Okay. So, two sodium and one iodide, it will enter the thyroid follicular cell from the blood. Okay. And actually, it is against the chemical and electrical gradient, and okay. this is a secondary active transport mechanism. Okay. So, actually, the thyroid stimulating hormone controls this reaction, whereas okay. the antithyroid agents like the perchlorates and thiocyanates 
they will inhibit this iodide uptake okay then coming to the uh, second step that is the synthesis and secretion of thyroglobulin actually this thyroglobulin is a large glycoprotein molecule and uh, it is made up of about 123 thyrosine residues okay. and this thyrosine residues it acts as a substrate for iodine for the synthesis of thyro okay. uh, thyroid hormone okay. now coming to the st third step that is oxidation of iodide that is the iodide that is being trapped inside the follicular cell that enters the lumen of the follicle okay through the uh, uh, through a um, exchanger called the chloride iodide exchanger that okay. is present in the apical membrane okay so uh, the uh, iodide it will enter the it will penetrate the apical membrane and it will reach the colloid okay so this chloride iodide exchanger is also called pendrin okay and near the apical membrane there is an enzyme called thyroid peroxidase okay. and this thyroid peroxidase will oxidize the iodide to iodine okay and thyroid is the only tissue that can oxidize iodide to iodine okay okay so uh, iodide is formed now the fourth step is the organification of thyroglobulin okay so here the there is iodination of these thyrosine residues and uh, their forms the thyrosine residues are iodinated to form MIT and DIT MIT is monoiodothyrosine and DIT is diiodothyrosine so in the coupling the next step is coupling reaction in the coupling two molecules of DIT will combine to form the thyroxine or T4 okay whereas one molecule of MIT and one molecule of DIT will combine to form T3 T3 so uh, that is the fifth step and finally the hormones that is being uh, formed is being stored in the colloid okay. for the future requirements okay. and this can be utilized for about one to three months. This will be the body. Surgery. Okay. Okay. Fine. So this is the one of the most, most important uh, common and expected, and expected questions, questions for the students. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Then, <clears throat> now, Doctor Nanai, and uh, can you just briefly tell the common blood investigations that we need to do when we have a patient with a suspected thyroid disorder? Because we'll come to symptoms and signs later. Because this has got yeah, this is a continuation, continuation yeah. of the same. So, as a part of uh, uh, a continuation of what uh, Madam has said, I think the most common uh, blood investigations that we do are actually the TSH, uh, the T3 and T4. I mean, you can, most of the laboratories have a total uh, T3 and T4. I'm just adding on to what you early said. And what is actually uh, done on a routine, uh, uh, probably, especially when you do a screening test or when you are in a comprehensive analysis and stuff like that, it's better as a screening, you do a TSH along with uh, a free T4 as well as an anti-TPO. Okay. I'll tell you why it is important. Uh, so the usual pattern is actually whenever there is a, a decrease in uh, TSH, and if there is an increase in the thyroid hormones, we are thinking of uh, something called as hyperthyroidism or uh, thyrotoxic spectrum. Whereas uh, when you have uh, a TSH being high and the thyroid hormones being low, then you are considering what is called as a hypothyroidism. Now again, uh, why this free T4? Because you know that the other one is actually bound. So the basic concept is free circulating one is actually more easy to actually uh, assess and the fact that it will have more specificity. Because uh, especially when you use it as a screening method, if you use the other one which is bound to uh, either the uh, thyroid binding globulin or albumin, there can be a lot of things that can occur in your system, especially when you are in a critical illness or when patients get admitted for something else, which can actually have a, a, an effect on the total uh, this one. But if you do a free T4, it is probably a little bit more specific. Now, albumin, you know, is a, is a negative phase reactant. So, there are a lot of things that can occur, uh, which can, biochemical changes can occur, uh, which actually helps in actually undermining the importance of the uh, the, the kind of thyroid hormone assays that we do. Uh, so, this is the basic thing that we do. Uh, but having said that, uh, we also sometimes assess uh, the thyroid antibodies like uh, thyroid peroxidase, thyroglobulin or TSH receptor antibodies, etc., which has its own significance. Now, I early said said that uh, a TSH with FT4 and anti-TPO is important. I think the most important reason why it is important is because we do have uh, conditions like subclinical hypothyroidism uh, where or subclinical hyperthyroidism and not overt hypothyroidism based on biochemical assays. So when you have a TSH which is between 5 and 10 and uh, the T4 levels or free T4 levels within normal. Uh, uh, you have to decide whether you need to actually just uh, keep these patients on follow-up 
or do you want to actually initiate on treatment? If these patients have overt uh, symptoms of hypothyroidism or the patients are uh, pregnant individuals, uh, then definitely it goes without saying that we'll have to actually initiate on treatment. But otherwise, if the anti-TPO or other uh, uh, antibodies are actually elevated, then it makes sense that you initially and early start the treatment. Okay. Now, there are also certain other blood tests which are not directly related to thyroid which can have certain uh, problems. I remember a case which was shown to me by my uh, a colleague who said the patient uh, complains of significant pain in his uh, lower limbs and calf. And for that, he had sent a CK levels and the total CK levels were very high. Okay, so we could not find uh, and a part of a routine evaluation and LFT was also asked where uh, AST levels also were find, found to be high. So we realized that it is uh, coming from a muscle source. And uh, then taking a history all over again, we figured out that there could prob probably be a hypothyroidism. And when we checked the uh, uh, thyroid functions, the TSH was more than 100. Okay, so uh, there are certain things like uh, uh, AST, LDH and uh, CK being elevated, cholesterol levels uh, including triglycerides being actually significantly high. Patients might have hyponatremia secondary to uh, hypothyroidism. Similarly, in hyperthyroidism, you will find uh, uh, your uh, ALTs as well as ALPs and bilirubin slightly uh, on the elevated uh, spectrum. Uh, and also sometimes uh, PTH, non-PTH mediated hypercalcemia uh, okay. can also be sometimes uh, be See. seen with uh, hypercalcemia. Uh, Glycosuria and other things have been also uh, described in uh, uh, hyperthyroidism. So these are certain things which you actually find Dynamic. in the uh, test which include in, in even an anemia, sometimes a normocytic, normochromic anemia or even a macrocytic anemia especially if it is associated with other autoimmune okay. conditions like vitiligo and things like that can be seen. So these clues also you should be able to uh, pick, it uh, pick it up when you actually order routine investigations. Thank you Dr. for that uh, extensive uh, uh, briefing about the investigation. Now, uh, Sidhu, the next important thing, that you have a swelling. The next uh, question that comes to our mind, how to evaluate that swelling? So, what are the radiological and who all require an FNAC? Do you ask for an FNAC for all swelling that is coming to you? So, can you just uh, give us a brief? Uh, so, sir, if you uh, if you are actually seeing a patient uh, with a thyroid swelling, first investigation will be a thyroid function test. So, biochemically, we'll see whether the patient is euthyroid or uh, no, or not, because only uh, uh, after correcting we'll be able to proceed with other management aspects. So, first is always biochemical investigation, uh, followed by we'll be doing a ultrasound scan. So all that we need to do in a case of thyroid swelling is an ultrasound because that is the most specific uh, test. So uh, ultrasound scan, uh, we uh, see for the nodule, the size of the nodule, the number of nodules because uh, sometimes we will be seeing only one single nodule outside but there can be other small nodules on the other lobes also. So we to make the diagnosis, we will see for the uh, number of nodules and uh, the nodule, the character of the nodule as such, whether it is a hypoechoic nodule or a hyperechoic nodule, the hypoechoic being uh, the notorious one. Uh, we will see for whether the characteristic of the nodule, whether it is a taller than wider lesion, suggesting again uh, it is of notorious one. Then uh, we will see whether there are any micro calcifications, whether the increase in vascularity, all these are suggestive of um, something which is little suspicious. So depending on the, uh, these characteristics, uh, there is Tirats grading, like Birats for breast uh, pirates for prostate, there is a tirates grading for thyroid uh, assessment in ultrasound uh, and there are tirates 1, 2, 3, 4 uh, grading. So uh, after doing the ultrasound, they will be grading this uh, particular nodule which is suspicious in this tirates category and um, depending on this tirates category, uh, we will think about taking an FNAC or not. This ultrasound will also help in identifying whether there are any other lymph nodes which is uh, present uh, which is uh, having uh, any suspicious lymph nodes in the neck plus uh, it also helps in taking the accurate FNAC from the suspicious nodule. So uh, if there is any suspicion which is seen in the ultrasound then we will be proceeding with the ultrasound guided FNAC and FNAC uh, we will be sending it to pathology again there uh, is a grading for FNAC which is the Bethesda classification uh, again there is class 1 to class 6 class 1 being uh, unsat unsatisfactory uh, smear sample uh, class 2 uh, 
is benign uh, three will be uh, atypical features class four will be having a follicular neoplasm five being suspicious of a papillary or a ca carcinoma and six being a proven carcinoma so uh, depending on the biochemical feature the ultrasound feature and this fnac we will be proceeding with the management aspect any uh, role for the nuclear scanning technicians in the uh, you routinely ask for it or we don't routinely ask for uh, nuclear scanning sir because only after the pr uh, procedure if the patient requires any more ablation of the thyroid then we'll be asking for nuclear scan just to see whether there are any residual thyroid tissue left behind so uh, routinely maybe for yeah, yeah. you can add on so because I, hyperthyroidism yeah. So I think uh, we prefer a technetium uh, 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 scintigraphy actually because uh, when, especially when patients present with uh, hyperthyroidism uh, to differentiate between whether it's a Graves which actually will have a diffuse uptake on technetium scan uh, whereas if thyroiditis is actually uh, there then obviously you will have absolutely no it, uh, uh, uptake uh, and other things like a, a cold nodule or a sing, 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 single hot nodule etc are different things but these are the two important things for a physician's perspective because the treatment actually makes uh, makes a di difference and sometimes thyroid antibodies cannot be relied upon always so, and this is one sure short thing where if it is thyroiditis induced i think we only treat with uh, i mean i'm not i'm just jumping across and just saying yeah. about treatment we treat it only with uh, uh, beta blockers and not start antithyroid yeah. agents only in graves disease uh, when there is a diffuse uptake we actually along with oh, supportive right. evidence of biochemical uh, this one we start patients on antithyroid yeah. Uh, uh, treatment yeah so that is uh, uh, maybe a uh, surgical perspective uh, you thyroid is willing and fna will be the most uh, important but when we have this hyperthyroidism these three things we need to differentiate that is a normal uptake whether it's a increased uptake or decreased uptake or a, uh, only a single area whether it's an uptake definitely and we will be going ahead with an fnac for those uh, cases so that is the only thing now uh, we're coming back to madam and uh, one uh, important thing that when we uh, teach our residents is that a patient is coming back to the scenario that we'll give to them. The patient has had a recent thyroid surgery. They have come to ED with Strider. So what will be a differential diagnosis? With this background, I just wanted you to overview what are the important clinical structures and the importance of uh, thyroid surgery and thyroid plan. So here comes the important relations of the thyroid gland with the surrounding structures yes. because uh, it produces a lot of clinical um, symptoms in the patient. So um, usually in the lobes of the thyroid gland coming to the apex of the thyroid gland, as I already said, there is a, a important relation of the apex to the superior thyroid artery and to that of the external laryngeal artery, uh, external laryngeal nerve, sorry. So um, you, during thyroidectomy or thyroid resection, so the by uh, as the th the superior thyroid artery and the external laryngeal uh, nerve lies in close relation up until the apex and then it separates from uh, each other so it is better to ligate the artery more closer to the apex um, whereas uh, towards the base of the thyroid gland um, the inferior thyroid artery comes in relation to the recurrent laryngeal nerve it has a variable relation uh, uh, the nerve to the artery so to avoid the artery to be severe, uh, the nerve to be severed, the artery is usually ligated away from the base of the gland so that the recurrent uh, laryngeal nerve will not be involved. Now, um, the other structures which are related to the lobes, uh, the surfaces are on the superficial surface, it is related to the strap muscles of the neck, okay. whereas the posterolateral surface is related to the contents of the carotid sheath, uh, the internal carotid artery, internal jugular vein, and the uh, vagus nerve in between. And the medial uh, surface is related to we remember as two, 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 like two tubes, two nerves and two muscles. So the two tubes are um, the trachea along with the larynx of the respiratory system. The two, uh, the other uh, tubes are the pharynx along with the esophagus. And the nerves which are present are the external and the recurrent laryngeal nerve and the muscles which are present are the inferior constrictor with that of the cricothyroid uh, muscle. So these, uh, and there is also um, an astro between the superior thyroid arteries of both the sides onto the uh, on the superior border of the isthmus okay. so and the another important relation is the presence of the parathyroid glands on the posterior border of the gland so that is, is also of clinical importance during 
resection of the thyroid gland uh, do you always say do you just said do you always resect uh, parathyroid along with it Can, or uh, parathyroid is preserved uh, parathyroid is always preserved sir okay. we we'll, we'll try uh, we'll be, not try we'll be def- definitely preserving all four parathyroids okay because um, as ma'am was telling it is very closely uh, in relation to the thyroid gland so uh, we'll take at most care to preserve <coughs> all four parathyroids because uh-huh. otherwise patient um, will be developing Definitely hypocalcemia hypo- post surgery okay so uh, that's previously and all uh, it it was like uh, there can be accidental removal of uh, they will not be able to differentiate where exactly is the parathyroid so now the surgical technique you are able to preserve the parathyroid we are able to preserve the parathyroid and uh, if it is uh, too much much adherent to the thyroid and if it is coming out inadvertently there is auto transplantation also which can be done okay. uh, so that the parathyroid will regain its blood supply later which can uh, help the patient that's uh, that's great thank you thank you sir so now uh, coming back to dr rose uh, uh, can you just uh, uh, give us an overview why we have a thyroid gland what are the function of a thyroid gland and what is the physiological effect of the thyroid hormone So uh, coming to the physiological effects of thyroid gland we can discuss under three headings okay. that is uh, calorigenic actions metabolic actions and the systemic actions so first about the calorigenic or thermogenic actions actually the oxygen it is essential for the oxidative phosphorylation of adp to adp okay. adp to atp atp so thyroid hormone it increases the basal rate of oxygen consumption okay. and thus it increases the basal metabolic rate okay and thus it increases the heat production okay. and thus the body temperature okay. so that is why a, a patient with hyperthyroidism will be having increased bmr then heat intolerance and perspiration or excessive sweating okay so that is about the calorigenic or thermogenic action now coming to the metabolic actions it can be discussed on five headings that is effect on carbohydrate metabolism protein fat vitamin and mucopolysaccharide okay So coming to the carbohydrate metabolism the thyroid hormone stimulates almost all the aspects of carbohydrate metabolism okay. that is it increases glycolysis gluconeogenesis etc then on fat metabolism it stimulates lipolysis okay so the fat stores are reduced and the plasma free fatty acids are increased mm, okay and whenever there is an increase in thyroid hormone it increases the cholesterol triglycerides phospholipids etc okay that is the thyroid hormone what it does is that it increases the ldl receptors in the liver cells okay so the rate of cholesterol excretion in the bile and the subsequent excretion in the fetus feces is in increased okay then uh, coming to the protein uh, metabolism actually in physiological amounts this thyroid hormone is a protein anabolic hormone okay whereas whenever there is an excess of thyroid hormone it is a protein catabolic, catabolic. hormone so uh, there is increase in breakdown of proteins leading to negative nitrogen balance okay that is why it causes uh, muscle Wait. weakness and creatinuria whenever okay. there is increase in thyroid hormone okay then coming to vitamin metabolism in uh, this uh, the thyroid hormone it converts beta carotene to uh, it is the thyroid hormone that converts beta carotene to vitamin e okay so whenever there is a deficiency of thyroid hormone this beta carotene cannot be converted to vitamin e okay. so this carotene will get accumulated leading to carotenemia oh. which is characterized by yellowish discoloration of skin oh. but in this sclerized spared okay okay then coming to the mucopolysaccharide metabolism the thyroid hormone actually it decreases the synthesis of mucopolysaccharides okay. especially the glycosamine and glycans and it promotes the degradation okay. of the uh, mucopolysaccharides mucopolysaccharide. so in hypothyroidism the thyroid hormone is deficient so the synthesis as well as the degradation is affected Effect. and the mucopolysaccharides usually it is ha- it is having a gel like consistency okay. that is why you get non pitting edema whenever you have mixed edema or hypothyroidism okay okay Okay. so that is about the metabolic actions now coming to the systemic actions so first we will discuss on the growth and development, development. that is the thyroid hormone it is essential for the normal body growth and development okay that is it increases the protein and enzymes and this is as i told then also it is uh, increases the production of growth hormone and somatomedin so it, in- it is essential for the overall normal no. body growth and development then coming to the important system that is cns that is uh, the thyroid hormone it's essential for the normal development of a central nervous system especially during infancy and childhood childhood that is it is essential for the gro- growth of cerebral cortex cerebral lar cortex then for the proliferation of axons dendrites then for the myelination okay so that is why suppose if you have a, <clears throat> a thyroid deficiency during infancy it can lead to irreversible mental retardation 
that is why it should be early detected and corrected as soon as possible okay so that is about the cns then uh, coming to the cardiovascular system the thyroid hormone actually it increases the uh, blood volume blood then it increases the blood flow cardiac output then it increases the heart rate so heart rate it is important that is the thyroid hormone actually it increases the receptors in the nodal tissue okay. and also it increases the sensitivity to catecholamines okay. so that is why whenever you have hyperthyroidism you get tachycardia even during rest or sleep so that's it then coming to the effect of thyroid hormone on the blood pressure because of the increase in heart rate and cardiac output the systolic blood pressure will be increased Increase. and because of the calorigenic action because of that there will be vasodilatation decreased peripheral resistance and thereby the diastolic blood pressure will be decreased Decrease. so the systolic blood pressure is high and diastolic blood pressure is low so the pulse pressure will be widened Wide. so in hyperthyroidism you get widened pulse, pulse pressure. pressure then coming to the git it increases the rate of secretion, secretion. and motility so in hyperthyroidism you get diarrhea and in hypo you get constipation okay then uh, coming to the effect on skeletal muscle actually uh, a slight increase in the thyroid hormone will make the muscle to react with vigor so okay. that is why in hyperthyroidism you get exaggerated tendon reflexes okay. whereas in hypothyroidism the muscle will react only slowly, slowly. upon contraction so you get delayed, delayed tendon reflexes and also in hyperthyroidism you get tremors at the rate of about 10 to 15 per second actually that is due to the over reactivity of the synapses neuronal synapses then an important point what i need to stress is the action on the eye that is in hyperthyroidism you get exophthalmos that is the edematous swelling of the retroorbital tissues that is nothing but the proliferation of the connective tissues in the within the walls of the orbit so there is a recent theory uh, that is uh, in that it uh, tells that there in the orbit there is pre adipocyte fibroblast and on these fibroblast you have TSH receptors and the TSI of the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin it will bind to these receptors and they form cytokines okay. that is the reason for the inflammation, inflammation and edema okay so that is in nutshell Shall the regarding the actually it is a very wide one wide, so yeah, yeah. concise and <laughs> because the answer the question was why we need a thyroid <laughs> line and it was elaborately discussed with this background now it is more relevant we'll just go ahead with the clinical features of hypo and hypothyroidism <laughs> i don't think we i need to say anything But more i think because uh, madam has said everything actually in detail with the actual mechanism of why each of these things are there but when we look at it as in a clinical perspective i think one thing uh, you need to actually look at is a uh, few clinical pearls that i'll give because all those things have already been mentioned in hyperthyroidism whenever somebody comes and tells you regarding uh, weight loss you always ask one uh, history of whether it is with preserved appetite or not usually a weight loss with preserved appetite is most probably an endocrine cause and when it's obvious i think it is definitely hyperthyroidism uh, so that is something that is there but in if any standard medical textbooks you take i think it's the the, the different clinical features have been divided into very common ones less common ones and rarer ones okay common ones and less common ones have already been covered uh, but certain uh, things that i would uh, like to say in women actually uh, what, uh, how uh, the menstrual cycles okay it gets affected uh, in uh, hyperthyroidism it can cause amenorrhea or even actually uh, oligomenorrhea uh, and uh, whereas in hypothyroidism you get uh, menorrhagia per se okay and uh, the propensity to develop atrial fibrillation definitely which is an important clinical entity uh, for a physician it is actually much much more uh, with uh, uh, definitely hyperthyroidism and sinus bradycardia which is actually significantly more with uh, 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 hypothyroidism certain other things which some of which have already mentioned regarding the high ck and things like that uh, similarly in hyperthyroidism you will get sometimes proximal myopathy and the mucopolysaccharide aspect has already been mentioned you will get something called as a pre tibial mixed edema in hyperthyroidism whereas a non pitting kind of an edema in a mixed edema coma or mixed edema uh, crisis per se 
so the classical thyroid hypothyroid facies is also important where there is significant coarseness of uh, features uh, there is uh, dry and textureless uh, hair uh, and uh, sometimes i mean the, again that has been the yellowish discoloration that are there which i actually understood much better after listening to her uh, re regarding the beta carotene uh, and things like that so uh, i feel uh, the major clinical features uh, uh, can be always and this is something that you have to refer your textbooks and actually find out because it's it's very important because now earlier I think a thyroid was a, uh, a chapter which was predominantly for the surgeons in the old curriculum but now I think if you look at the uh, new topics in medicine one topic is exclusively for uh, thyroid based disorders and I think it is very important that this can even be a, a clinical case uh, which earlier used to be under only surgery where we could also be actually giving you a clinical case uh, in. in for discussion because common cases are what actually we are going to keep from now onwards hair loss yeah hair loss okay. alopecia uh, i mean uh, there are n number of things which you can actually uh, think about uh, uh, it might be a lot of thing would be repetition so i didn't want to actually say everything again so even hypo and hypothyroidism both can cause this hair loss yeah, both can, both can madrosis so these are the all the common things that uh, what we keep in your mind so to summarize the clinical features and hypothyroidism maybe everything can be slowed down something like that we can keep that maybe like constipation cold intolerance decrease in the heart rate yeah. edema the bm the basal metabolic rate is coming down and when you go to the weight gain also when you go to the hypothyroidism the common symptoms that we can remember is the weight loss increase in the appetite and all those things we can keep those things in your mind uh, Sidhu now uh, the most important question that I wanted uh, is that uh, the previously uh, whenever we get a question uh, we used to get a question like thyroid stone so that was the very common uh, general surgery perspective question so how will you manage a thyroid storm if uh, if at all you are admitted or seen a patient uh, uh, definitely it, it is a multidisciplinary approach you need your physician's help as well as the surgeon's help so whether you straight away take into the surgery or uh, what are the uh, things that you will do before uh, when you have a patient with thyroid stroke and both of you can complement each other uh, for uh, this aspect as uh, so first of all as i mentioned before we never take a patient uh, without uh, making the patient u thyroid for a surgery okay. because thyroid storm uh, will be uh, present uh, if the if you are taking a hyperthyroid patient without controlling the patient uh, adequately before surgery and thyroid storm as such is not only totally surgical it can be a medical thyroid storm also <coughs> so in case of uh, patient is having hyperthyroidism and if it is not controlled patient getting any infection any sort of infection any sort of stress the patient can go for thyroid storm uh, one other surgical uh, co complication will be uh, if you are taking a non unprepared patient for surgery intraoperatively patient can go on for thyroid storm so the anesthetist will be the first person to notice the uh, changes which will be uh, happening in the body so the the patient can get tachycardia um, uh, increase in body temperature uh, and uh, other other uh, features will be there so uh, initially we will be giving beta blockers propanolol iv intravenous propanolol will be given uh, to control the heart rate and the peripheral conversion everything uh, then uh, you uh, give the cooling blankets and uh, and for the uh, hyperthermia management then uh, you will be giving uh, anti thyroid medication carbimazole is not available as a intravenous <coughs> so we give propel thyuracil instead uh, so propel thyuracil will be given uh, uh, diazepam will be given for uh, relaxation purpose so uh, basically um, it will be managed uh, along with the anesthetist in such a scenario okay so, doctor no, I I just uh, an overview of uh, each steps <coughs> We need to steroids and a lot of steroids. Uh, steroids, I mean, in, in, in a, a situation where thyroid storm is there, I think uh, uh, hydrocortisone 100 mg uh, uh, Q8 hourly to 6 hourly definitely needs to be added. That is the only extra thing that I want to, I want to add to that. But otherwise, the algorithm is the same. I think first is definitely the uh, uh, beta blocker therapy and then comes the antithyroid. Like he mentioned, uh, uh, the uh, uh, carbamazol and methamazol is actually not available. So I think definitely the um, one that is preferred is propyl. Uh, thyroracil and uh, then uh, uh, I think uh, the, the 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 triggers is much more important actually how to prevent that trigger uh, to make the patient clinically youth thyroid before actually uh, doing any procedures on a thyroid I think not just the surgical aspect even yeah. actually 
uh, an FNAC also I feel can actually trigger if un, if not properly uh, uh, ensure that the patient is actually <coughs> utile uh, treatment. You know that even in the best of the centers, uh, sometimes we can actually have problems and mortalities if it is not actually uh, uh, detected very early because it can cause significant other problems which includes a higher uh, output cardiac failure, patient can go into AF and things like that uh, and significant hypothermia related complications. So all those things uh, uh, unless and until you have a good critical care setup it might be difficult to actually uh, manage. manage yeah and uh, one more this thing we when we learned this thing is that pregnancy we avoid uh, methimazole and uh, propyl thiouracil is the drug for pp for pregnancy so that was the previous concept now uh, if the patient is on low dose of carbamazole it is accepted to some extent or uh, you still prefer to put the patient on propyl thiouracil mm prefer to put on propyl thiourosyl. So, I think uh, if the patient is something like 10 mg, you will make it to 100 mg of propyl thiourosyl. That will be the usual conversion factor into 10 times of what uh, uh, the patient was taking, uh, carbon So, with this in background, I, the la next question uh, will be, the most common what we see is hypo and hypothyroidism. Previously, it was hypothyroidism. Now, we are seeing a lot of hypothyroidism also. So, uh, uh, sometimes the patient initially goes for hypothyroidism, as you have already mentioned, they will come to hypothyroidism. So, how will we manage this hypothyroidism? It's basically more of a medical management. Yeah. So, uh, hypothyroidism uh, management, I think I would like to divide it into an actually a uh, patient which is normal versus in certain special scenarios and then I think I will touch upon mixed edema coma yes. also, I think. So, uh, in a normal uh, individual, I think to start off 1.65 microgram uh, per kg can be started. This roughly comes to somewhere around for a 70 kg individual is about 100 microgram. Now, a lot of uh, strategies are there. Some people actually started with uh, 50 microgram, uh, increase it, uh, I mean, reassess after three weeks and then uh, go on to about 100 to uh, uh, 125, whatever uh, the uh, strength is. But uh, most of the, uh, the newer uh, strategies says that if actually patient is otherwise well off, you can even start off with 100 microgram and then titrate accordingly. But when will you check the TSH after starting? That is another important thing. I think TSH should be checked uh, uh, minimum minimally after six weeks. I think uh, probably six weeks to eight weeks would be the right, right. time to actually uh, reassess uh, 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 a thyroid function. And what do you want to achieve? We want to achieve a TSH which is actually within normal range. Uh, 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 range. Within normal range also I would, I would actually because the normal TSH range is between about 0 0.5 to 5 in most of the laboratories, I would like to keep it between 2 and 3 or uh, uh, FT4 uh, just above or upper limit of uh, normal. But usually when I actually follow patients because of the cons cost constraints and things like that, I usually just do uh, TSH and try to keep it between 2 and 3 and see whether the symptoms have resolved. Now symptom resolution also actually takes time. The, the weight gain uh, and uh, all the uh, other, uh, uh, the basal uh, metabolic rate related functions can actually slowly, I mean, come down actually as early as about uh, a third week uh, per se. But certain things can actually be much prolonged, like whatever has already happened to the skin, the coarseness and things like that, we can take a long time. And sometimes as a very uh, uh, late, uh, very uh, uh, rare manifestations, patients can have cirrhositis, okay. like pleural effusion, ascites as well as pericardial effusion. I had a patient who took about 9 months uh, for the pericardial effusions to actually completely resolve. Never uh, required a pericardiosynthesis, never went into a tamponade state, but actually significant uh, 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 this one on the x-ray okay. and uh, repeated echoes had to be done till actually patient actually became completely uh, dry. So uh, that is something that we have to understand regarding a normal scenario. But there are certain scenarios where actually special groups are there, like in an elderly individual. I mean, you have to understand that the clearance is actually less. So you have to reduce the dose and you cannot give a higher dose. Similarly, patients with underlying uh, heart heart diseases, uh, ischemic heart diseases, what will happen is if you suddenly increase the metabolic <coughs> metabolic rate, angina and other ischemias and infarctions can occur and this can be detrimental for the patient. So in such patients, we actually even started as low as about 12.5 slowly titrate it up every uh, one or two weeks based on the uh, this one and then reach the basic uh, uh, the required uh, dose so this is something that we usually use uh, do in a regular population another important uh, population definitely is pregnant women 
so you uh, d- uh, whatever dose that is going on i think uh, regarding the hypothyroidism uh, uh, dr uh, sri krishna has already said here also i think an increase of 30 to 50% is really required uh, if its patient is already known hypo- uh, hypothyroid uh, uh, where in the first trimester obviously the dose has to be much more and then there are algorithms and actually uh, trimester related uh, 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 cha- uh, dosing charts available where you will have to check and adjust it accordingly and if uh, whenever you require a help i think obviously uh, 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 going to a sub specialist where endocrinology consultation has to be given to actually make sure that this is going on adequate okay so that is important now coming to the uh, uh, the other other spectrum of the uh, uh, the emergency that is mixed edema coma again it is a very important emergency that is there and most of the uh, times actually we can lose patients if it is not even detected properly so when it's detected you know the uh, features associated with that patient will have hypothermia and here also i think it's very important that we actually start steroids the uh, uh, the reason is that until uh, unless proved otherwise we would like to consider it as a secondary uh, hypothyroidism uh, uh, and uh, treat uh, as early as possible steroids are very important so li- like 100 mg uh, q8 hourly to 6 hourly can be given and the other treatment uh, like rewarming uh, and uh, making sure that the patient does not uh, because the sensorium is going to be low uh, does not aspirate and other basic uh, measures of antibiotics and other things like that have to be given but the most important thing is how to give the thyroid now iv preparations unfortunately we in our scenario we do not have it so what we usually do especially because the patient is uh, significantly uh, uh, in a comatose kind of a stage we put a rails tube and give the uh, higher dose of the uh, medic- uh, the medicine itself I, we understand that the absorption is going to be very less that is why we go up i mean if you are uh, uh, looking at something like 200 then you give 200, 200 and then see how it, it, it responds the response will be low because the absorption is going to be less but uh, that is the best we can actually do at uh, our scenario yeah for mixed edema coma and uh, then as soon as the patient with hyponatremia is likely to, to be there so that also might uh, require connect, co- correction and these aspects have to be looked at and again like i mentioned about uh, thyroid storm it has to be actually uh, in a, a critical so care set thank you and uh, just one more question uh, do you start uh, uh, looking at the tsh somebody is coming with your report like my tsh is 10 do we start treatment for them or we will wait for them? so i uh, mentioned this about uh, subclinical hypothyroidism and i discussed so i think uh, the overt symptoms if it is there or patient uh, 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 belonging to a special class okay. like uh, pregnant women definitely we have yes. to start otherwise a, a useful test you can actually uh, add on is uh, checking a Uh, anti tpo if the anti tpo is elevated you eventually know that this patient is likely to go into hypothyroidism so the study says that it is better to start earlier but otherwise between 5 to 10 and some older textbook says 5 to 20 where the sub clinical hypothyroid range it is usually better uh, to wait and watch and to see uh, repeat uh, tsh and ft4 levels after uh, uh, about 6 weeks okay. yeah okay. and uh, so that uh, we have elaborately regarding the pharmacological aspects and coming to the surgeon so who all requires surgery so uh, which all patients you decide okay this patient requires a surgery and what you prefer whether it's a total thyroidectomy or a subtotal um, so um, not all thyroid swellings require surgery so again it depends on uh, like we have already already discussed regarding the bethesda classification for the uh, pathology classification so uh, depending on the bethesda classification if there is a, a atp uh, which is category 3 or if there is a follicular neoplasm and so 3 and above we'll be uh, uh, suggesting for surgery and uh, one other uh, Uh, indication for surgery is the cosmetic indication even a category 2 benign thyroid swelling but if the swelling is very big uh, the patient doesn't want to have a uh, such a big swelling then uh, again will proceed with surgical management or if the swelling is uh, go- uh, going retro sternally which might uh, 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 which might compress the ves- vessels great vessels so then again we'll proceed with surgical management so so these are the indications for surgical management in a thyroid uh, swelling or a thyroid nodule so and coming to the surgical aspect of it um, unless it is a solitary nodule of a single lobe then we can suggest the patient for the option of a hemithyroidectomy hemithyroidectomy is removal of a of one lobe along with the isthmus preserving the other lobe 
ओके सो इन हेमी थेरोडेक्टमी इफ if the surgeon is proceeding with a hemitheroidectomy then the patient should be counseled that if in case the histopathology report the final biopsy report is coming as a carcinoma yes. then within the next uh, two weeks the patient sh- should be undergoing a total thyroidectomy if the patient is agreeing to that particular uh, wow. plan then it is uh, okay and it is textbook recommended to proceed with a hemitheroidectomy if not the uh, the patient is telling i'm not planning for a second surgery i don't want my thyroid gland you can remove it so in such a scenario you can proceed with a total thyroidectomy but always the complications of total thyroidectomy will be explained to the patient so i'll proceed with the total thyroidectomy yeah. so again uh, coming to the complications i'll i'll be telling it like we explain it to the patient so there will be a scar uh, a collar crease scar like a crease in the neck there will be a scar which will be seen which will be almost around 10 cm and post uh, surgery the patient like we discussed before the parathyroid uh, blood supply can get affected so the patient can develop a post operative hypocalcemia uh that that is another complication then we uh, forgot to mention regarding the most important thing which is the uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve which runs in the tracheoesophageal groove if there is an injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve the the quality of voice will be changed so prior to taking up a patient for surgery we always send the patient to the ENT to check for the uh, to do indirect laryngoscopy to check for the vocal cord assessment because prior to surgery medico legal aspect we need to know that the vocal cord uh, yeah. is working properly or not so um, recurrent laryngeal nerve is of great great importance uh, when com- when coming to thyroid surgery and last we'll tell about tell the patient regarding the life long thyroxin yeah. supplementation thank you thank you dr sidhu so uh thank you all for that uh, uh, brief overview i think we have almost covered everything we some special uh, situations only that's what we have not maybe nuclear who not re- ablation and all those things we haven't covered like lugol's id in the nuclear therapy which is not to the limit of an undergraduate student so what is basically required for an undergraduate student started with an anatomy physiology the important questions and uh, from uh, medicine perspective hypo and hypothyroidism are very uh, commonly asked questions and we can have clinical scenarios uh, being given and they can have a long case also and uh, definitely surgery uh, thyroid swelling is going to be come as a long case for you so if the patient is there definitely it is going to come and uh, theory aspects also uh, we have almost whatever we have covered is all essay questions and uh, it can come as a short note so uh, once again thank each one of you uh, for attending this vertical integration thank you all